Hello and welcome to That's Wow. I'm Xiao Yun, a nature guide and environment educator, and I'll be your host for this podcast series. We'll be talking to a variety of special guests about some wow and wonderful topics surrounding nature conservation in Singapore, our city in nature. That's Wow is brought to you by the National Park Spot. If you like our content, don't forget to show your support by hitting that follow button and giving us a five star rating. Today's episode is all about rewilding and we've invited Jim, who is the Group Director of Conservation in NPARKS, to explore this topic with us. Together, we'll unpack what this term means, how it relates to the way we understand nature and the wilderness here in Singapore. Hi, Jim. Hi, everyone. My name is Jim. I'm the Group Director of Conservation uh, at the National Parks Board. Uh, that actually means that I'm a glorified site manager. Basically, I take care of all the nature reserves in Singapore including Central Catchment Nature Reserve, our largest nature reserve at more than 3,000 hectares, uh, the very famous Bukit Timah Nature Reserve, uh, as well as the Sungai Bulo Wetland Reserve. Uh, there are also two other uh, cute uh, smaller places that I, I take care of. Well, not necessarily small, uh, but uh, one of them is uh, Labrador Nature Reserve and the other one is Pulau Ubin, the, the entirety of Pulau Ubin. So, uh, we take care of these places, we manage them, uh, we do a lot of uh, activities with the community there, including habitat enhancement and restoration activities, as well as species recovery efforts that take place within these reserves. So first, I think we can just explore what rewilding might mean to you. Right. Um, yeah, because we all know there are very understandings of what rewilding means, um, you know, and obviously like most of the literature is more advanced elsewhere in the world and there's not as much done I guess, in our part of the world where it's already pretty wild. Yes, yes, yes absolutely. Yeah. I think uh, rewilding in the Singapore context is extremely, extremely focused and it's very re unique, right? So when you're talking about rewilding in uh, many other places in the world, you must understand the context of the environment, the context of their geography and landscape. When you're talking about, for example, rewilding in Yellowstone National Park or parts of Europe, uh, the land is so large that you will be able to uh, practice rewilding by literally introducing large mammals, right? Hoof ungulates, horses, deer, wolves, and things like that. In Singapore, you have to look at our context. 710 to 720 square kilometers. We have uh, 5 to 6 million people packed into it, right? So in the absence of a very large hinterland where you can do a whole lot more, right? Singapore basically has to turn the entirety of the nation, the entirety of the island into a big green matrix. So our rewilding efforts are uh, focus a lot on habitat enhancement, habitat restoration, creating connectivity. And this is actually part of um, uh, one of our key tenets, basically, in the Nature Conservation Master Plan, as well as our city in nature efforts, right? Uh, planting up, planting up as much as possible using native species, such that we can then encourage uh, very important uh, indicators of the healthy ecosystem in Singapore, like the birds, the bees, the butterflies and the dragonflies, flying animals, uh, and some small mammals, right? To basically uh, be able to proliferate, uh, be able to sustain their populations, uh, to be able to grow, to be able to roost, uh, to be able to move from big green patch to big green patch. And in so doing, because they are pollinators, because they are dispersers of seeds, they can actually help us along the way by basically pollinating our native plants as well as dispersing the seeds. So our natural areas become more natural. I think for me, right, and, and you, might, you might laugh at this um, because you laughed at the literature that we read when we were in school, right? Okay, so for context, um, we've met Jim before um, and um, we've, we've talked about like how our, our ideals of wilderness is very much of influenced by the media that we consume, right? Yes. So like, uh, like for example, growing up, if I watch like Little Mermaid and I watch like Bambi, my idea of wilderness is like those, like a uh, European forest or like a uh, cerulean blue seas. That's to, that to me is like a uh, pristine wilderness and I can't help but feel an attraction towards them. And, yeah. and it shows like, like when I first went to London when I was 15 for a geography field trip mm. and we went up to like Lake District to, so that we can understand like what inspired poetry of Bronte sisters and right. like William Blake and, and right. those kinds of persons, then you really could see that like that sublime nature mm -hmm. 
very like uh, mild temperatures uh, was what like inspired uh, those uh, works of literature. So thankfully, as I like grew older, I managed to explore a lot of like uh, regional like uh, environments, like regional ecosystems. So like really like tropical rainforests in like Sumatra and Malaysia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then I got to know more of our Singaporean habitats also. All right. Yeah, so like meaning like coastal mangroves, like our beaches, getting to see like that these are full of biodiversity as well. So now mm-hmm. my understanding of wilderness is more like balanced. Yeah. And I think you are absolutely right. Our definitions, our own understanding, when we close our eyes and we imagine the word wilderness and what does it mean to us is uh, inevitably influenced by what we have consumed. We are always taken in by the beauty, the grandeur of nature, but most of those were actually temperate forests. Landscapes are beautiful, right? You have big Alaskan mountains, uh, you have the heather-covered moors of your Emily Bronte books and all that kind of stuff. And the important thing to remember is that in Singapore's context, and in fact, the whole tropical context, mountains are few. In the tropical forest context, Basically, the amount of biodiversity, the amount of life, the diversity of plants, the diversity of animals within these tropical forests are far, far better than what you typically and traditionally experience when you read the romanticized writings of the 1800s and the early 1900s, right? So, thing to remember is Singapore, in terms of nature, when you're looking at the abiotic elements, the mountains, the rocks, the ice, the glaciers, the beautiful trees turning orange, there isn't a whole lot of that. But when you scale it down to the tropical rainforest, you see that it's got a whole lot more biotic elements, a whole lot more biodiversity, a whole lot more species of plants, a whole lot more species of animals. And therefore, you know, the wilderness and nature in our context uh, is no less worthy of respect. In fact, it's worthy of more respect, right? It is something that also took millions and millions of years to build, uh, but the structure is totally different from uh, what you experience as grandiose uh, scale of nature that you used to experience when you read your books and when you watch your TV dramas in the old days, yeah. How much intervention do you think, like Jim, is good enough for um, rewilding in an urban landscape like Singapore? Uh, I think human intervention when we're talking about rewilding is again an inevitability at whatever scale. So when you're doing rewilding in Yellowstone National Park, it also takes the decisions and the actions of human beings. Um, and there's this very, very nice story that I think everybody has heard of. It is the story of Jadav Payeng. Have you heard of Jadav Payeng? He is very, very well known as Forest Man of India. And this is the story of how one man, over the course of 27 years, has essentially single-handedly planted a forest twice the size of New York's Central Park in his little plot of land, uh, which is basically... Uh, uh, a riverbank uh, over 27 years and now it's grown big into a forest and there are leopards and there are elephants coming in and it's a very inspirational story and he has won, won many awards uh, but you see the, the background of that story is it still took one man although it's one man it, it's still a person human person right uh, and in Singapore we have to uh, remember that whatever nature-based solutions we put in place, whatever habitat restoration and enhancement in order to make the ecosystem uh, better, in order to recreate uh, compromised habitats, it is always done by the people, with the people and for the people, right? Human beings benefit when uh, we have healthy ecosystem services. Human uh, beings benefit because healthy ecosystems can help clear the air of pollution. For example, bring down temperatures when uh, climate change related weather patterns become extreme. Uh, a, a nicely planted cityscape will be able to help you uh, sponge off water when there are heavy rains. Right? So human beings benefit and we understand that a properly functioning urban ecosystem with good habitats, healthy habitats, uh, will actually benefit humans in the long run. So it's very important to understand that uh, greening in Singapore, rewilding in Singapore, bringing nature back to the Singapore urban cityscape is not for nature's own sake. It's also for the people. And that's why we bring the community in. And it's very important to bring the community in because it gives them uh, ownership 
of this patch of nature that we call home. So it's again very unique, right? It's a very unique vision of people living in harmony with nature. And of course, it's still evolving. We're still learning along the way. But I think we've taken a very nice first step towards doing that. So I think there's probably like another school of thought, which is like rewilding just means like don't touch, let nature thrive on its own, let nature like come back on its own. Mm -hmm. And humans shouldn't even be in nature, I guess, in the first place. So Mm. again, like why wouldn't that kind of thought work in Singapore? Yeah, I think for me personally, the main reason why that doesn't work in Singapore goes back to my earlier point about Singapore being an entrepot, being a hub for the past two centuries. There are many, many, many invasive species uh, in Singapore. And if you essentially uh, have a no intervention sort of method to rewilding, what you will see in the species mix right over the next 10 years, next 50 years, is essentially a whole lot of non-native invasive species um, proliferate. And that can actually be dangerous uh, for our nature reserves, our core nature reserves, many of our native species, because many of these plants are actually extremely aggressive. Now, if you've seen photographs, and I can show you a few photographs of how, for example, uh, Dioscoria zanzibarensis, uh, as well as the Sesperilla plant, uh, how they grow, how aggressively they grow, how aggressively they can smother saplings, uh, smother even adult trees, you know, uh, at the fringes, especially when uh, you have open areas where there's a tree fall, open areas where there's a clearing at the edge of a forest, you will see that uh, their aggressiveness will essentially set back the natural regeneration of a Singapore native plant-dominated forest by decades, if not centuries. So uh, there is no guarantee that you'll be able to eradicate that. So as I've pointed out before, I think the main thing about our habitat restoration and enhancement efforts, particularly at our nature parks and fringes of nature reserves, is to bring the community in and do invasive species management. Before we continue, let's take a pause here for a fun episode break. In the spirit of our podcast title, That's Wild, I'd like to invite Jim to share something wild about biodiversity that you guys may not have known before. The one that I can think of is this species of gecko. A wall lizard in Singapore, for those who don't know what geckos are. And Singapore has a few species, but one of the most common ones is this species, uh, which has a mottled colour and you find it everywhere now. right? It is the Lepidodactylus lugubris, also known as the maritime gecko or the morning gecko. Now, this species is very widespread in the Asia-Pacific. It's found uh, from Taiwan all the way down to Indonesia, all the way around the Pacific Rim. And it has been introduced into even South America, Central America, and all of the Pacific Islands. Now, the cool thing about Lepidodactylus lugubris, the maritime gecko or morning gecko, is that they are almost all female. There are very few males uh, that have been found. And even then, most of the males are sterile, which actually means that the reproduction of Lepidodactylus lugubris, the maritime gecko, is through parthenogenesis. They don't need a man. They essentially hatch eggs, which do not need a sperm donor. And the eggs and the babies that hatch out are clones of the mother, which means that theoretically, if you follow the entire heritage of the maritime gecko, there must be an eve of the maritime gecko and all the progeny, generations upon generations of this lizard are all clones of this one original mother gecko. How cool is that? That's cool. Or maybe, that's wild. (laughs) Yeah, that's wild. (laughs) Or maybe the species evolve such that they need no man. Like maybe the man were all phased out. Which is why it's doing so well, by the way. I think 
I think like maybe to, to kind of like take us back a bit, like to set the historical context, right? I, I guess when we became independent, we had already lost like 97% of our forests and, and across a lot of different habitats, like from our like freshwater zone forests to our the more familiar like tropical rainforests. And similarly, we also lost like maybe like 73% of our coral reefs mm -hmm. in the marine uh, space. So given this... Uh, how is rewilding being carried out now in Singapore? Uh, I, I think that's a very good question. And the remarkable thing is that when you talk about 97% of forests lost, even in 1965, the, the actually scary thing, which is actually quite a cool uh, fun fact, is that 97% of forests were lost by the year 1930, well before we even attain uh, independence, right? And it is remarkable that nature is so resilient that despite all this, right, uh, by 1930, uh, we still have many, many species of plants, many, many species of animals still surviving and hanging on. And I think it's testament to our very good work uh, on the whole as a people of Singapore that we understood that nature was important for Singapore and we worked very hard to bring back nature into Singapore. Uh, and as to how we do it, I think the best thing to do is to look at our nature conservation master plan. First and foremost is to protect and conserve our core habitats. Right? And the number one thing we did was to essentially gazette our four nature reserves. And in order to protect that as well, we have introduced nature parks around them to basically ensure that the footprint of our nature reserves are buffered by these nature parks, which also allow people to come and partake in nature-based recreation without having a ton of traffic going into our core nature reserves. Um, then the second thing is essentially making sure that they are connected, right? So we have had a very good decade of introducing nature ways into Singapore and those nature ways act as very important connectors not just for people to get from green space to green space, but actually with judicious planting, uh, with very good selection of native plants, these nature ways have now become very beautiful as well as uh, very ecologically important connections for dispersers, for pollinators. So part of that second component is also to naturalize our parks. So previously, you know, before... When you're talking about uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, our parks were very manicured, very managed, right? And now you go to a park, for example, like Bishan Amokyo, and that's a park, that's not a nature park, that's not a nature reserve, but it's so natural. It has a naturalized canal with otters in it, right? So naturalizing of our parks also adds a further component into Singapore being uh, more organic, uh, being more habitat conscious, uh, being more able to provide uh, flora and fauna and the people who enjoy the flora and fauna with more spaces to basically hide, with more spaces to grow families, with more places to roost. The third one, which is uh, something that perhaps may uh, uh, need another feature, another podcast to cover, is the amount of research and science and technology that goes into this, right? So for example, before you engage in species recovery programs like we do, the first thing to do is to get a survey done, right? And a survey is actually no small thing. Sometimes it can take many years. And in the past decade, again, uh, we at NPARCS, we have introduced a whole lot of technology into doing our surveys. Previously, for example, if you wanted to do uh, a, a survey, camera traps were never a thing. You had to go around a transact using your eyes to spot animals and, of course, Animals occur sometimes at night and you can't even see them. So with the advent of camera traps, with the advent of night vision devices, we will be able to capture uh, and see all these, uh, especially mammals that come out in, in the nighttime. So survey methods are important. Baselining is important. And a lot of our policy decisions with regard to conservation are not whimsical. They are not. Uh, something that I, I just happen to think of. It's always founded on a very strong foundation of science done by scientists both within NPARCS and uh, with our community partners, some of which are academics in the universities, some of which are actually citizen scientists with a uh, very strong interest in the fields in which they work. And that then segues, brings me to the fourth component, which is community stewardship, right? 
Uh, I've given a few examples of how we engage the community in our planting, our invasive species management. And I just talk about how important the community is in supporting us in our research efforts as well. Uh, it is paramount because we have to make sure that everybody, especially youth like you, understand that a green city in nature, full of thriving biodiversity, is actually part of Singapore's DNA. I think one of the strengths, one of the four strengths that you mentioned, right, I think which is like the one specific to species reintroduction mm -hmm. and the work that we do, uh, I mean, or the MPAX uh, spearheads, you know, to reintroduce specific species is actually very admirable because even though we're not reintroducing like huge megafauna like right. wolves, mm -hmm. we, are, we are doing like, you know, as you said, the baseline surveys to decide mm -hmm. There are certain species that we do like prioritize and we want to take care of, especially like endemic species like yes. the Johora Singaporeans. Precisely. That. You know, there's so much. I think every time I go into a freshwater stream, I have never seen the Johora, but mm -hmm. every time I see another crab, yeah. I would say that this is one of six species in, in Singapore and yeah. they are very protected here. Yeah. So maybe, Jim, you could speak about like species recovery and species mm. reintroduction. So like maybe another case study, you know, that's quite yeah. interesting for you. So far, we've been talking about plants, right? So I, I think I think that's a very good question about animals and uh, what we do with regard to species recovery. Uh, as I said before, um, what we don't do at this point in time, is to make uh, is to make species which are extinct or extirpated in Singapore de deliberately reintroduced, right? So our species recovery efforts have always been in helping animals which are extremely rare, uh, but still exist in Singapore, and at the same time, animals which were extirpated before, but somehow have come back into Singapore and have taken a foothold in Singapore to basically do better because. Uh, we know that they were gone for a reason, but we also do know that when they come back and hang around for a few years and in fact start to breed, then there is a reason for that as well. And we want to figure out what the reasons are and mm, help make the conditions better so they can thrive. Of course, the biggest success story which everybody has heard of before is the hornbill, right? They were extirpated for 40 years. We've not seen them. They flew across once in a while. But suddenly a population established itself in Pulau Ubin and soon on the mainland and we saw that they were actually not doing too badly. So we helped them out again, just a little nudge, but we actually had uh, an action plan that included uh, putting up nest boxes for them and now we have a, a, a thriving population. In fact, they are practically common in Singapore. So what we do is always very considered, always together with the community and to make sure that we help the species along rather than reintroduction. Because I think uh, the environment that these animals need are more important than just, you know, taking animals, breeding and then chucking them in. So every animal that we have, basically we have to consider the availability of the environment, the availability of the habitat. And if they are separated, again, to, to introduce the connectivity of the habitats, to find out what the animal likes uh, with regard to its living conditions, you know, what it likes to uh, eat, what it likes to roost, are there sufficient plants for it to basically uh, survive uh, as a thriving, sustainable population. So I can also add a plug for our Habitat Enhancement and Restoration Handbook. There are tons and tons of not just uh, the policy as well as the techniques behind doing Habitat Enhancement and Restoration, but the cool thing about this book is that it has tons and tons of actual case studies of how we applied it in Singapore, uh, not just in our nature parks, our nature reserves, but also in our parks. And it also has a very cool chapter on uh, one big element of connectivity, which is essentially the eco-link bridge that bridges the Central Catchment Nature Reserve as well as the Bukit Timah Nature Reserve crossing over the BKE, how it was built with pictures and with background on how we decided, uh, you know, the look and feel of the bridge, uh, how to plant it and what we planted it with, as well as the follow-up uh, that showed that animals were using it. It's a very cool thing. It's all freeware uh, and there's a link that we shall link it to. And with that, we've come to the end of our episode. Thank you, Jim, for joining us today. More information about nature waste and other rewilding efforts can be found on our website, which is linked in our episode show notes. Do share your thoughts on this discussion with us on Impact Socials and give us a follow if you've enjoyed our content. My name is Xiaoyun and thank you so much for listening to That's Wow. Stay tuned for more exciting conversations to come. Wow.